Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Gloria Davies. I'm an adjunct director of the Australian Centre on China in the World, and um, I also work at Monash University, and I'm a long-term collaborator of Jeremy Barmy, so let me just declare that, that interest right at the start. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to say a few words about Jeremy Barmy before he delivers the inaugural China in the World annual lecture. And it also gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor, uh, Professor Ian Chubb, the former Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, who is here with us today because he played a very important part in the setting up of the centre. Now, Jeremy clearly needs no introduction to this audience, as I'm sure we are all familiar with some part, whether large or small, of his very impressive oeuvre of articles, books, commentaries, essays, translations, and films. Now, Jeremy, in my view, approaches scholarship always also as a work of art, and his artistry is plainly evident in the precision and elegance of his prose. His erudition, in turn, is the result of the discipline and rigor that he applies in crafting his interpretations and narratives of the Chinese past and present. In early 2009, Jeremy shared with me and several others his growing desire for a collaborative undertaking that would facilitate the renewal of intellectual and critical inquiry into China. He had in mind a series of interrelated projects in the humanities and social sciences that would not only provide rich insights into Chinese ways of seeing, doing, and sense-making, but that would also probe the dangers and limitations of both Sinocentric and Eurocentric ways of understanding the self and the other. A year before that, in 2008, he had written something of a position piece, his essay on new Sinology, in which he set out his thinking along these lines. Now, what he had in mind a year later in 2009 was something really quite audacious. It was an ambitious enterprise that would represent a development out of new Sinology, a vast and robustly multidisciplinary venture guided by an open-ended interest in the dynamic and intricate complex of forces shaping the conduct of political, cultural, economic, social, and in, in fact, everyday life in the Chinese-speaking world. He called this enterprise, which at the time was just the kernel of an idea and certainly an imagined enterprise in 2009, Organic China. Now, it was two winters ago in 2009 that a group of us gathered, gathered at Jeremy's home in Canberra to engage in a lively debate and discussion about the viability of organic China, and more specifically, of how we might begin the process of trespassing against conventionally defined disciplines to speak in more organic terms of an evolving China, and indeed of a multiplicity of Chinas, and of the patterns and sensibilities that continue to shape the development of these multiple or plural Chinas. Now, what we also shared as our conversations progressed was the common critical intuition that human lives and human pursuits do not and have never accorded with the concepts, paradigms, and fields that institutional knowledge would have them class classified under. Our camaraderie developed out of our common interest in ensuring that people must never become mere concept fodder. Meanwhile, Jeremy's notions of new Sinology and organic China, and I must point out that Jeremy had certainly never thought of new Sinology and organic China as you know, grandmaster concepts, uh, and certainly not paradigms, but rather he conceived of them as intellectual dis dispositions or critical dis dispositions. In any case, New Sinology and Organic China had become our common property, as is the way with all good things, and quite happily for us. 
These disp dispositions of new Sinology and organic China had also, quite happily, as I said, come to inspire our former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd to found the Australian Centre on China in the World. And, um, and, and again, I would like to acknowledge the enormous role that Professor Ian Chubb played in helping to facilitate the, uh, the process of founding the centre. And now, without any further ado, I shall now invite Jeremy to come and speak to you and to infect, infect you with his passions, as he has done to those of us who subsequently became his co-conspirators in the Australian Centre on China and the World. Jeremy. Gloria, thank you so much. Um, and again, I'd like to say also personally how delighted I am that Ian Chubb is here, who not only helped foster, nurture, protect, um, and throw his considerable um, institutional weight behind the creation of this uh, Australian Centre on China. Well, it's wonderful to have you here, Ian. Chief Scientist of Australia now. There's, as you know, there's a microclimate following him everywhere. It was here in the Great Hall of the Australian National University that on the 22nd of April 2010 last year that the then Prime Minister, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, presented the 70th Georgie Morrison Lecture. The title of that oration was Australia and China in the World. Towards the end of his lecture, he announced the establishment at this university of the Australian Centre on China in the World itself. Our centre, or CIW for short, initiated informal activity shortly thereafter and over the past six months, we have formally begun major work related to research and engagement with both government and the public. This biennial conference of the Chinese Studies Association of Australia provides an ideal opportunity for us to launch the CIW annual oration. And for this inaugural lecture, I would like to address the subject of Australia and China in the world, whose literacy. In the opening words of his Morrison lecture, Kevin Rudd acknowledged the first Australians on whose land we meet and whose cultures we celebrate as among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. In his oration, he also recounted the lineage of ANU academics who have contributed to the study of and engagement with China since the university's foundation in 1947, 1946. It was that year, 1946, that the economist Douglas Copeland was appointed Australian minister to China. Copeland would later become the first vice chancellor of this university. In China, he observed the decline of nationalist or Guomindang rule, along with its moral authority. He became an early advocate of establishing relations with the newly created People's Republic of China. He also revived the Morrison Lectures, which had been halted in 1941 during the Pacific War, and gave them a new home in the new ANU. In 1948, Copeland himself presented the inaugural ANU Morrison Lecture under the title the Chinese social structure. Copeland also invited C.P. Fitzgerald to Australia to establish the university's work on China while laying the foundation for our library's important collection of China-related materials, something that many people come to Canberra to use and enjoy. In May this year, another diplomat, the outgoing Australian ambassador to the People's Republic of China, Dr. Jeff Raby, addressed a meeting of the Australian Institute of Company Directors in Beijing. The topic of the ambassador's talk was an interrogation. It asked, what does it mean to be China literate? Drawing its lessons from years of experience in China, it was also in part Dr. Raby's envoi to his service in the diplomatic corps. The ambassador said inter alia, the good news for those of us who struggle with the language is that speaking Chinese is neither a necessary, is neither a necess necessary nor a sufficient condition for being China literate. To be sure, it is an immensely valuable asset when dealing with the Chinese, but to say that to work effectively with China and the Chinese, one needs to speak the language is to set the bar too high. It runs the risk of deterring serious engagement. In many ways, of course, Dr. Raby is right. Australia has had a strong trading relationship with the People's Republic that itself long predates, predates formal diplomatic recognition in 1972. Many of the most incisive engagements with China over the past decades have been managed by canny business people, politicians, and assiduous diplomats with scant or no background in China or Chinese studies. 
In a front page article, the indefatigable Sydney Morning Herald correspondent in Beijing, John Garno, detected a clear dig at Dr. Raby's boss, the now Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd, when the ambassador remarked further on in his speech, and I quote, to speak Chinese is not to know China. Many examples can be found of people who speak Mandarin to a high level, but who do not understand how China works. They may have learned their Chinese shut up in their study reading the Analects. The converse is also true. People can and do develop a deep and sophisticated understanding of contemporary China by being here on the ground, meeting people and building relationships. One would note that Kevin Rudd first encountered the Analects here at the ANU under Pierre Rickmans, a sinologist whose many accomplishments include an acclaimed translation of that text. Journalists in the, the Australian newspaper pursued the theme of Garneau's article. Colleagues here today will appreciate that a grounding in the Confucian Analects may not be quite the quaintly esoteric knowledge implied by the ambassador's remarks. After all, in 2011, the first sign of political discord at the heart of the Chinese polity came when a newly refurbished National Museum of Chinese History in February um, when, when a, came when a statue of Confucius appeared on the eastern flank of Tiananmen Square outside the newly refurbished National Museum of Chinese History in February, only to be spirited away suddenly in late April. Those with even the most rudimentary awareness of the tides and eddies of Chinese history appreciate how powerfully Confucius, his works, and his reputation have featured in that, China, that nation's life and politics over the past century, including as a core element within China's much vaunted soft power initiatives recently. Confucius's sudden appearance on Tiananmen and equally sudden disappearance was a clear sign that something was stirring in the Chinese capital. Whatever the reading or misreading of Dr. Raby's speech by local commentators, its salient points are worth revisiting here. There are, these are that for success in conducting business in China, one, you don't need Chinese. Two, you need on the ground experience. Three, you should know Beijing. And four, you should be Anglo-Australian. I've been told that like me, some members of the business audience perceived within these four basic principles for China literacy, less a sniping at our Analex literate foreign minister than a personal pitch for a post-ambassadorial career in the corporate sector. <laughs> it's interesting that only a month later, this time addressing business leaders in Perth, the ambassador emphasized the great importance of Chinese language training. As it was reported in The Australian, Dr. Raby, and I quote, lamented the lack of interest in China in local corporate and political circles. He questioned the failure of schools to teach Mandarin and noted that Australia had not opened a new diplomatic office in China for 20 years. Two long-term and key advocates, not to mention practical activists, for China literacy who worked here at the ANU. One is Professor Stephen Fitzgerald, formerly an ANU historian, later this country's first ambassador to the People's Republic, and subsequently a prominent business consultant and educator. Another is the leading economist, Ross Garneau, also formerly a professor here, and also an Australian ambassador to the People's Republic. The broad-based teaching of the languages of Asia, including along with Chinese, Japanese, Indonesian, Korean, Thai, Vietnamese, and the languages of India, as well as the literatures and histories that are entwined in and expressed through those languages have in many senses fallen into desuetude. Not here at the ANU, of course. For all the efforts of people like Professors Fitzgerald and Gano, as well as former Vice Chancellor Copeland and our own recent Vice Chancellor and other Vice Chancellors here at the university, we are confronted with what in 2002 Stephen Fitzgerald called a lost debate. Steve then was chairman of the Asia Australia Institute at the University of New South Wales when he made a speech about this lost debate. His observations are as pertinent today as they were nine years ago. He asked, with regard to this lost debate, what did we lose? He said, not everything, of course. And I quote, we have the trade and the tourism and the students and the other things for which we campaigned. But we lost the debate about the way, about the way Australia and Australia at the level of policy and foreign relations between states and business and university relations discovered, engaged, enmeshed, became part with, of, in, or about Asia. It was about 
not replacing the Western, never about replacing the Western, but about making a place alongside it for Asia by broadening the cultural horizons and changing the intellectual universe of Australians. At the time, Michael Wesley, now head of the Lowy Institute for International Policy in Sydney, worked with Steve at the Asia Australia Institute. In his recent book, There Goes the Neighbourhood, Michael discusses Australia's prosperous age in this transmillennial, in the, what he calls the transmillennial decades, that is the 1990s to 2010s, that have been, has been fed by the Asian economic boom. In one of the most powerful statements in that book, Wesley reiterates the sentiments expressed by Professor Fitzgerald when he speaks of what Wesley calls the great paradox of modern Australia, and I quote, never has there been a greater gap between Australian society's enmeshment with the world and its levels of interest in the world beyond its shores. A country that is aware, as never before, that the rise of Asia holds the key to its future, for good and ill, has been steadily divesting in its capacity to understand and influence its, re its regional environment. A nation that has become profoundly cosmopolitan and well-traveled over the space of two decades has, at the same time, become more belligerently self-assertive and inflexible in the face of a globalized world's challenges. When you look around at the great convergence and the coming geometries and psychology of power occurring just off Australia's northern coast, the last role you would choose to take up would be that of an insular nation. But that's exactly what we have chosen to be in the early 21st century. Now there is something notable in the arguments about Australia's role in Asia that run both through Michael Wesley's book and the, in the September 2010 quarterly essay by my ANU colleague Hugh White, entitled Power Shift, Australia's Future Between Washington and Beijing. Both authors concentrate on issues to do with strategic positioning and beneficial alliances, yet the human dimension, including broader questions of cultural and other kinds of enmeshment with the countries, in particular the boom nations of Asia, are sidestepped. It would appear that Stephen Fitzgerald's lament for the lost debate now finds only a dim echo. Programs supporting Asian studies and the study of Asian languages in particular were central to educational initiatives in this country in the 1980s and 90s, but beginning with the advent of the Liberal Coalition government in the mid-1990s, they've suffered from the narrowing of national vision that has unforgivably continued under Labor, government, Labor governments since 2007. This is true despite the constant, if plaintive, refrain of concerned people in government, business and education that there is a pressing need for greater emphasis on Asian language and cultural literacy education in our schools. Now, of course, most of you in this audience will have spent your professional lives engaged with, to use a glib shorthand, the pursuit of understanding China. You know the expression, Dong Zhongguo. We're all familiar with the fact that Chinese friends and foes alike speak of whether one does or does not understand China. Whether one shows some cynical insight into contemporary Chinese reality or accepts the role of complicity as a friend of China who cannily steers the way to success, one is praised as being a Zhong Guo Tung or old China hand. Although I would note that for many years I've also heard such people being referred to by a more down low Beijing gutter expression, Yang Hun Le, or Yang Hun Hu, that is somebody who is a and the word player, a foreign player, P-L-A-Y-A, a foreign player who has game. When I first studied politics, literature, history, and philosophy, as well as political economics, as determined by Marxist Leninism, in the People's Republic in 1974 onwards, we were told to our faces that our status was that of foreign friend, Wai Guo Peng Yo. You knew that behind your back you were being more likely spoken of as being a foreign spy, Wai Guo Jian Die part of the Western-led cabal of capitalist conspiracy set on undermining China's revolution and frustrating its global ambitions. China literacy, not a au courant term back then, of course, meant in effect that you should tow the ever-shifting line of cultural revolution politics. You soon became inured to finger-wagging xenophobes telling you to adjust your attitude, duan zheng tai du so that you could achieve the blessed state of having an objective, 客观, an accurate, 正确, 
understanding of China, its revolution, and its people. After the collapse of the high Maoist worldview during the extraordinary era of post-cultural revolution, rehabilitations, and revivals, I lived and worked in Beijing and Hong Kong and set about figuring out how to understand China, Dong Zhongwo, in my own way. And I did so by studying Chinese writers and thinkers of the 20th century. My guides, and forgive me for listing a few of them, my guides included Cai Yuanpei, Hu Shi, Lu Xun, Feng Zikai, Zhu Ziqing, Zhou Zhuoren, Lin Yutang, Yu Pingbo, Fei Ming, many names of which you'll be familiar with. These writers and thinkers defined their own cultural literacy outside of party politics, whether it be nationalist or communist politics, beyond their ideological struggles and even apart from the imperial burden of the past. Some found fellowship with non-Chinese writers and thinkers globally, as well as cultural exemplars of the late Ming Dynasty, the Song, the Tang, and earlier, including the Wei Jin period and among the pre qin philosophers. They created a particular genealogy of the Chinese modernity that drew inspiration both from the best the world had to offer <clears throat> as well as drawing from the wellsprings of China's own humanist tradition. I was aided in my quest for literacy in their tradition by men and women whom I met during the Renaissance years that followed the Cultural Revolution. They included the translator Yang Xianyi, the artist Huang Yongyu, the critic Yu Feng, the calligrapher Huang Miaozi, the playwright Wu Zhuguang, the publisher Fan Yong, founder of Du Shu Magazine, the editor Pan Ji Jiong, and the literary figures Chen Rongshu and Yang Jiang. These individuals were profoundly literate in their country's culture, politics, and realities. However, at various points in their lives, all of them had become China illiterates. They had failed to understand China. As progressive and urbane as they were, they could or would not always keep up with the ever-changing demands of the party, and they paid a heavy toll for it. But if they were sometimes or even often on the wrong side of the party, they remain on the right side of history. Along with the oral historian Sang Ye, the historian journalist Dai Qing, academics like Lei Yi and Xu Jilin, outspoken irritants like Liu Xiaobo and Ai Weiwei, and many other well-known or unknown men and women, unknown to you, they have all taught me much about the complex realities and certain underappreciated forms of China literacy. On November the 9th, 1989, five months after the bloody events of the 3rd and 4th of June, Stephen Fitzgerald presented the 50th George Morrison Lecture here at the ANU. His topic was Australia's China. In it, he focused on the illusion so recently shattered that there had been something unique, something even special in the Australia-China relationship, even taking into account a certain widespread antipodean naivete. Steve said, and I quote, this still doesn't explain why people all over the world seem to take leave of their senses over China, and I can't explain it altogether. I've debated it with many people over the past couple of decades, and there are many explanations for this sinophilia. It's certainly the case that since Marco Polo, Westerners at least have been fascinated and seduced by China. Perhaps, Steve said, it was the gustatory or sensual infatuation or due to the nature of Chinese language, its architecture and art, it also, he said, had to do with what he called the living fossil fantasy. And I quote, we see the continuity of Chinese civilization and imagine today's Chinese to have participated in the building of the Great Wall or the invention of printing or an ignorant Chinese peasant to be some kind of Confucian intellectual. But the living fossil fantasy is also carefully fostered, particularly by Chinese in official positions. Chinese have innate skills and genius, Steve said, at persuading foreigners how different China is and verbally and fulsomely rewarding them for small steps in understanding. But part of the Chinese psychology is that also foreigners can never understand China. And Steve goes on to say, I have known sinologists of 60 years' experience and great wisdom to be told by Chinese officials, ah, but you don't understand China a statement delivered with a finality clearly believed to confound all further argument from foreigners. Foreigners, particularly West Westerners, are thereby drawn to know more fully, to, f to, to know more, to fully understand. And with all the wiles and wisdom of, experience, of an experienced seductress, 
Chinese play upon the mystery, upon a theme about the alleged attributes of all Chinese. The inscrutability, brackets, which is all just good acting. The delusion that all Chinese are infinitely patient, brackets, which is untrue. Never lose their temper, well, which is wrong. <laughs> are culturally superior, brackets, often the pretensions of the ignorant. Are experienced, wise, and temperate in matters of government, brackets, witness June 4th. There is still no adequate analysis of this phenomenon, which for the time being we must take as a given, documented but not explained, the syndrome of Marco Polo. Soon afterwards, the Chinese party state began elucidating the requirements for the achievement of an objective and accurate understanding of China, specifically what it called its guoqing, that is, its unique national conditions. A nationwide campaign was launched after June the 4th, to re-educate rebellious students and citizens alike. Then, it set about re-educating the world. We were told, collectively, that you simply don't understand China's unique national conditions. This is a line that today, as you all know, is still chimed with certainty and stridency by average citizens just as leaders of the party state employ it when addressing foreigners. Unless you appreciate and accept unequivocally China's unique national conditions, you betray yourself as lacking insight into and empathy with the mysteries of that country's tortured history and complex present realities. It's important to understand this officially engineered Chinese worldview, just as we need to be mindful of how the guided Chinese media, from print to electronic and educational practice, have created what I have elsewhere called China's flat earth. As people engaged intellectually with China, we particularly need to understand both the official discourse and its historical and ideological underpinnings. It is significant that today's Australian business people and even the media refer fluently, fluently to the Chinese government's 12th five-year plan. It's now widely recognized that the success of economic interaction with China can benefit directly from just such selective literacy. But to get a grip on larger Chinese realities, possibilities, uncertainties and insights into how the past and the present will sculpt the future, I believe it's necessary to go well beyond simply developing an ability to grasp party state programs and formulations. During his opening address to the 2011 China update here at ANU on the 12th of the July, July, just a few days ago, Sir Roderick, or Rod Eddington, a man with decades of experience in East Asia, remarked that he felt that while business with China has seen a boom over the last 15 years, an extraordinary, remarkable boom, in terms of a deeper engagement and awareness that little had changed from the 1990s when he came back to work in Australia for a period. He even felt that in many ways such things as the teaching of Asian languages, ideas and culture had, and I quote, stalled. Sir Rod suggested that an inward-bound Chinese investment, that as inward-bound Chinese investment increases in Australia, people will have to deal with many complex and potentially confounding issues. Ill-informed but entrenched attitudes and beliefs have the potential to generate serious friction. We had a preview of this in the media hysteria in mid-2009, both here and in China, over Chinalco's failed bid for Rio Tinto, the detention and trial of stern Hu, Hu Shuthai and the participation in the Melbourne Film Festival of the Uyghur activist Rabia Kadir. More recently, we have seen a similar tendency in the public discussion of the, of the purchase of agricultural land in the Hunter Valley by Chinese concerns. More recently still, we have been faced with the prescriptive pronouncements on Australian governance and the mining tax by Chinese embassy official Ouyang Cheng and representatives of Sino Steel warning of the deterrence that lay in the path of Chinese inward-bound investment in Australia. These are all challenging issues requiring a sophisticated, informed, and dare I say, China literate response. Sir Rod spoke of how debates in Australia easily become tinged with xenophobia. He did not comment on the fact that the same hold tr holds true in China, where the moment the opportunity presents itself, politico-commercial media outlets eagerly evoke the shadow of the white Australia policy the spectre of Pauline Hanson, or other skeletal remains in our historical closet. Sir Rod stated his belief that as we become more enmeshed in Asia and with China, businessmen and women will need to participate in the public debate in a way that is engaged and well-informed, educated. I would venture 
that these things will not be helped in the process if people rely too heavily or too readily on what elsewhere I have called a translated China. That is a version of China's story as told, interpreted, and translated exclusively by the party and its organs. Chinese businesses, its party, state, and citizens will also have to work on their Australia literacy. Wealth and power are all very well and good, but they are not the sole requirements for living and prospering in a pluralistic world. At a recent event organized for the Sydney Writers' Festival by our Centre on China and the World, Linda Javen, you see there, gave the Morrison lecture the other day, offered her view of Jeff Raby's Beijing speech, and I quote it because I think it covers a lot of important ground talking about translated China. As Linda said, Jeff is a friend of mine, and I wouldn't presume to know what's best for business, but I'm afraid that on the subject of China literacy, he's only half right. It's true that fluency in the Chinese language, sorry, I'm channeling you. It's true <laughs> that fluency in the Chinese language is not a sufficient condition for China literacy. But I would argue it is a necessary one. Chinese culture, politics, language, and society are part of an integrated whole. Gaining fluency in Chinese is hard. It's slow. It takes decades of dedicated time and time. Ded dedication and time. In this time-poor, distraction-rich world we live in, however, we tend to resile from things that take dedication and time. Isn't there an app for that? We have, I fear, become like the housewives of the 50s and 60s, mesmerized by time-saving conveniences like TV dinners and electric can openers. Google Translate, anyone? At least an electric can opener opens a can. The inescapable fact is, to become more literate as a nation, more of us need to put in those hard yards and learn to speak, read, and write Chinese, says Linda. Otherwise, our understanding of China will always be structured and filtered by the agendas, the biases, and the errors of translators and other mediators. Linda's remarks chime with what, for some time, I have termed new sinology. When I first spoke about new sinology in 2005 in the newsletter to this Chinese Studies Association, I was evoking a tradition of intellectual engagement and scholastic practice that dates from the Wanli reign period of the Ming Dynasty in the late 16th century. It's a long time ago, 400 years. It involves understanding a civilization is more than merely a geopolitical territory or a particular government entity, governmental entity. Such a sinology, and yes, I know that for some people in China studies, sinology is a very dirty word. Anyway, such a sinology is a concatenation of practices that have evolved over four centuries. Two imperial dynasties, the years of the Republic of China and into the present era of the 62-year-old People's Republic. New Sinology reflects and advances previous endeavors by individuals and broader communities of scholars to understand the complex living heritage of China's past, its constant presence, and its relationship to humanity in general. It articulates a generous academic approach to China and is duly aware of disciplinary boundaries and practices in the academy. It is ever mindful of the importance of the conditions of historical conciliation, that is, this newfound and extraordinary rapprochement between the dynastic, the republic, and the people's era, republic eras of China in China itself. The goal of a new sinology is to understand, study, and appreciate China through locating it, itself inside the Chinese world in order to communicate what animates and inspires this world. It is attentive to the kind of detail that enables the shadows, the legacies, ligatures, burdens, possibilities and constraints and constants of China's contended pasts to come to light. As China in recent decades became a stronger and more economically confident country, as parts of the Chinese world have been able to recuperate their traditions of thought, the cultural practices, the vast corpus of literature and history as part of the articulation of a modern selfhood, with a level of equanimity not experienced since the decline of the Qing Dynasty, does it not behove us also to incorporate these new trends and understandings in our study of and teaching about the Chinese world? To do so with a renewed critical clarity and thoughtfulness is part of the enterprise that I call New Sinology. Crucially, New Sinology is an approach grounded in a broad empathy that aims to bridge the gap between the accumulation of the cultural knowledge of the insider and the practice of principled intellectual engagement. This approach, empathetic yet critically independent, 
is, in my view, vital to our studies and to this country's ability to engage with China as well. It is, in essence, China literacy. In, 2000, in April 2008, the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd caused something of a stir when, in addressing a Peking University audience in Chinese, he voiced concerns about China's human rights record and the situation in Tibet, even while affirming the numerous positive dimensions of the bilateral relationship. He couched his comments in terms of being what he called a Zhengyou of China. As he put it, the gloss on the term Zhengyou being a partner who sees beyond immediate benefit to the broader and firm basis for continuing profound and sincere friendship. Those who rely for their literacy of China on the translated, whose interests are confined to that which is relevant or useful, but in the short term, whether it be in the sphere of business or diplomacy, need to appreciate the fact that whatever their Chinese contacts might say to their face about their ability to understand China, perhaps even calling them a Zhong Guotong, in the end they'll be considered at best a simple-minded, even malleable friend. As long as things go well, everything, everybody muddles through together. But when they don't, there's no substitute for the ability to think about, engage with, and contend with a China that is itself a world of complexity. It is the environment of the university where contending ideas are expressed, discussed, and debated that properly provides a free forum in which received beliefs and attitudes are subjected to rational analysis and discussion. Without the febrile pursuit of ideas, the healthy clash of views, paradigms, and approaches. The world of the mind is but a barren landscape. I would suggest that the natural, and of course ideal, disposition of the university belongs to that of the Zhengyou, an empathetic and engaged friend who can disagree, a trusted interlocutor, a principal partner in understanding. Our relationships with colleagues, with students, with the various intellectual traditions of which we are custodians and to which we are contributors is in its essence often that of a Zhengyou. We expect to be challenged. It is integral to learning and to the cultivation of the engaged scholastic mind. Monolithic or monolinear narratives may well suit governments, ours as well as others, but in, as engaged, informed, and China literate thinkers and educators, we have the responsibility to contribute to the public debate around China to help society as a whole become China literate. All in all, the foreign editor of the Australian newspaper, Greg Sheridan, has not been an unalloyed fan of ANU academics or of its China specialists. Many will know that. But he got it pretty right. I was astounded. He got it pretty much right when he wrote about Australia's present China strategy in June this year, just last month. And I quote, he said, many commentators regard Rudd's, Kevin Rudd's statements on human rights abuses in China as a mistake or frivolous, yet they are fundamental to Australian self-respect, fundamental to maintaining civilized international order, and they are immensely important to our ally in Washington. He went on to say, it is insane for Australian commentators to regard the mere fact that the Chinese government does not like such comments as proof that it is wrong to make them. Part of the great strength of Rudd's China policy is its balance. But Australia's political debate has become so polarized and unsophisticated that any balance, any internal tension in any policy seems exotic and almost un-Australian. Sheridan then goes on to say, some of Australia's diplomats and officials don't always enjoy Rudd's leadership. Well, probably not just them. Quite rightly, he is happy to overrule them and make the big political decisions himself and he will insert political values and the broader strategic considerations into the China relationship, whereas often they just want smooth business. In recent times, colleagues here at ANU have noticed an important bifurcation in the understanding and discussion of China. That is the People's Republic in this nation's life. There are those who rightly concentrate on the momentous significance and value of the resources boom, trade, and two-way investment with China. At the same time, there is increased anxiety, and not only among security analysts, about the strategic challenges of China's rise and the import of its regional military buildup. There is concern that, while others may lecture Australia on the problems of its two-speed economy, 
we in this country may be developing a two-tier discourse on China itself, one that may well create friction and contestation at home, let alone abroad. As, adem- as academics, we may well or should indeed have a different perspective or a range of perspectives, more likely, different from the more narrow bore pragmatists, the focused group-driven politicians, or even effective business people and judicious diplomats. My vision of our work is one that is driven by humanistic thought. I know it's so unpopular and daggy and old-fashioned. It's a thought that, and I quote Clive James, a famous Australian writer living in London, it's a humanistic thought that by its hunger, its scope, its vitality, and its inner light, an inner light produced by all the aspects of life illuminating one another in a honeycomb of understanding. Some may well be concerned rightly about funding or simply lying low and keeping safe, but we are part of a public enterprise and we must think beyond the constricting circumstances of institutional demands. Through speaking to and through the media, print, TV, radio, electronic, through social media, through translation and commentary, we can enrich and enliven the discussions about China, China in the world and China in Australia. Our centre wants to encourage such engagement and to help foster new generations of students, scholars and practitioners in China literacy. In closing, I'll say a few words, again quoting Clive James in his remarks about the English historian Louis Namier. And James says, one of the measures of our commitment to civilization is the extent to which we realize that material strength can never be more than a part of it, even if the part is essential. At a 1929 conference on the promotion of Chinese studies at Harvard University, the German-American anthropologist and orientalist Berthold Laufer said that he hoped that Chinese studies in the United States would make up for some of the sterility that he felt marked the study of China in Europe. He looked forward to, and I quote, the creation of a new humanism wider than that of the Mediterranean world. He remarked, a truly humanistic education is no longer possible without a more profound knowledge of China. We endeavor to advance the scientific study of China in all its branches for the sake of the paramount educational and cultural value of Chinese civilization and thereby thereby hope to contribute not only to the progress of higher learning, but also to a higher culture and renaissance of our own civilization and to the broadening of our own ideals. We advocate with particular emphasis the study of the literature and language of China as the key to understanding of a new world to be discovered as the medium of gaining a new soul. In some respects, it's these concerns that motivate some of the most engaged Australians in China. Speaking recently with a businessman who has had a long-term and very successful career working with China, I noticed that he said that China's rise should lead us, in particular, to question our own values, our system, and our behaviors. For all of us who study China, this touches on something that is central to any serious engagement with the Chinese world or with Asia generally. That is the ways in which China's presence as a country and a civilization confronts us and causes us to interrogate our own understanding of the world, our principles, our values, our intellectual trajectory. This is the centenary year of China's 1911 Xinhai Revolution. In Linda Javen's Morrison lecture the the day before yesterday, she noted the role that both W.H. Donald and George Morrison played in the early days of the first Chinese Republic. Donald helped draft the uh, communique announcing the Republic of China's creation. That was a time when Australia's own relationship with Chinese in Australia was still profoundly fraught. In his 2007 book, Big White Lie, The historian John Fitzgerald provides a unique account of the Chinese experience in this country in the decades leading up to our own moment of national transformation, Federation in 1901. It is a book that offers an account of the history of Chinese in Australia that is nuanced and complex. It is a history that has contributed in surprising and important ways to the creation of this country. It is also part story of racial tensions and exclusion that should now continue to inform our views of the past as well as our understandings of the present. Big White Lie was written at a time, written and published at a time, when specific Australian values were being vaunted as something that were, and I quote, a distinctive suite of national values 
that are regarded as a unique preserve of Australians rather than by a common set of universal values. Perhaps today people are clearer on the point that universal values in our context retain a particular Australian idiom, to use Fitzgerald's expression, and that a broad embrace of them, that is of universal values, underpins in vitally important ways this society and its worldview. Among other things, they include, of course, respect for the rule of law, democracy, institutions of state, freedom of expression, and association. As events unfold, the debate over values, be they national or universal, may well reappear in this country. We should similarly be aware that in the People's Republic of China, a shrill discussion about the importance of what are called Chinese values, over the importance of those over what are regarded and sequestered as universal norms, has been raging in recent years. It is a discussion that will also inform and impinge attitudes towards Australia and Australia towards China. In the same year that Big White Lie appeared, the Chinese Premier Wen Jiabao, 2007, published a poem entitled Gazing Upwards into Starry Skies, Yang Wang Xin Kung. In it, Wen Jiabao wrote lyrically of the pursuit of and solace in truth, justice, vast possibilities, and hope for humankind. Now, as you all know, in China, when you gaze skywards these days, more often than not, what you see is a pea soup smog mist. Just as we share a global climate, Australia shares in that particular Chinese reality. Just as we in this country value broader human values, people in China are alert to a language and disposition of possibility. It is, I believe, that possibility that can and will inform a shared literacy in the human condition. Thank you.